Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline, joined today by Dr. Frank Tift in part two of our EMS updates from Tennessee ASAP 2019 here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Tift is an EMS, um, EMS fellowship trained boarded emergency physician here in the, in the Chattanooga area with Erlanger. And um, last week, uh, last episode, we talked about some of the LLSA updates that are kind of applicable to both emergency physicians and EMS. But really this week we're into the the really the meat of the some of the biggest discussions in EMS over the last 10 years. And that has, has to be the final precautions. Um, I mean, it took forever. It was a, it was a dogma uh, that we held on to for so long with the rigid backboards. And, you know, even the sea collars now are starting to evolve as well. But uh, brought Dr. Tift in here, who's talking about it at this conference to see um, where we are, where we stand, and what we need to be doing, or really probably more importantly, what not to be done with regard to spinal immobilization. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Tiff. Oh, you're very welcome. All right, so where are we? Um, we've been discussing the longboard for a decade or so, and the sea collar is starting to is starting to work its way towards the chopping block. What's the evidence say? Evidence is definitely pointing away from continuing to use longboards, at least to the degree that we have been so comfortable using them before. Um, they certainly still have their uses. I'll go ahead and say the most the most notable of which is that they can be very helpful in moving a patient uh, and keeping the spine aligned while a patient is being moved. But as far as keeping someone on a cot or in an ED bed, um, still on a backboard, it's in general pretty much gone by that it's not worth it anymore to keep them on there while they're on the bed, uh, which I think is what we've been doing in the ER for a while now, mm-hmm. in general, that's one, yeah, of the first, that's one of the first things you do when somebody comes in on a backboard is take them off and just have them lying on the ED stretcher. Um, but this is starting to, the evidence is becoming strong enough that we are moving away from necessarily even using it pre-hospital. So just kind of to be aware that you may start to receive patients from EMS that maybe just have a C collar on and that that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, and that's, so here's, I'm going to give you a little back in my day. Um, you know, starting off in, with surgery and trauma, at that point we had the four slice scanners and there was no digital imagery, so everything was on a film. The patients would come in with trauma on a long board with a C-collar on and they would remain on it until after the CT scans were read uh, by the radiologist. So you're talking about potentially two and three hours from arrival um, that they were on the backboard and you know the number of pressure-related ulcers, of course... Uh, everybody on a backboard starts developing back pain within about the first 10 minutes. So then you're evaluating that as well. And that first step being getting them cleared when they came to the emergency department. And now with my service in Lexington, um, we are very limited use. And exactly as you talked about, um, the backboard is an extrication device and a movement device, but not a transport device um, there's multiple studies, and I'm sure you've got some of them there to talk about the, you know, the the movement and the the relative harm of the backboard and movement of the spine in relation on a backboard versus the cots, which in EMS are designed very well to hold people in the middle and in alignment with those little uh, those those little lips on the side as, a, mm-hmm. as opposed to what we have in the hospital. Oh, certainly. Yeah, that's essentially where we are right now. We've even gotten to the point which we'll we'll talk about here in a minute or so that a pretty recently released joint position statement from uh, ASEP, the National Association of EMS Physicians, and American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma released a joint position statement within the last couple of months talking about spinal motion recommendations and basically saying that it's okay to forego using the backboard. There are other options that can do just about as well, which one of which is, as you said, the EMS stretcher usually does Mm -hmm. a perfectly good job of keeping somebody stable. Well, and even the new vacuum-type mattresses. That, That's another one of that, the options, yeah. Yeah, and I know a lot of EMS is moving towards that mm-hmm. because it actually forms to the patient. I mean, if you think about a backboard, look at a rigid backboard. I mean, scoops are a little bit better, not much. Um, but look at that and tell me about tell me what about that is physiologic and meets the way human beings are built with our spring S-shaped spine, should be, um, and we're putting them on something that's the equivalent of a, well, if, if, you're an old, if you were a lifeguard back in the day, it was, liter- it was literally plywood with a couple mm-hmm. of rails underneath it. 
and um, some of the EMS is that, but now it's those plastic versions, but nothing about that is, is physiologic at, at all. So, you know, with most of us now, we kind of tiptoed. When the American College of Surgeons came on board, that seemed to really what kicked it. It's oh, yeah. the same thing that's going on mm -hmm. with the sea collars. As soon as they come on board, that's when we can really move with it. Because a lot of times they're the ones doing a lot of the receiving at the trauma centers with our emergency medicine colleagues. And so getting all of that on board is, is what really can move this conversation. And, you know, there, there's criteria, and there's a lot of it out there. I don't know if you've got it with you, but, you know, the criteria for when to consider it. And a lot of times now on the conservative side of the back boards, it's altered mental status, neurologic deficits, significant intoxication, things like that, or uh, focal point tenderness uh, or step off, you know, things like that. But even then, when they're getting in the hospital, we're still taking them off the board. Mm -hmm. So why not consider that earlier and prevent those secondary injuries? Exactly. And I'll go ahead and say the, a lot of the way I think about this a lot, particularly when I'm talking to other people about this topic, is kind of as you're going against the dogma that everybody's used to putting it on. So we can talk a little bit. And what you've already uh, touched on is what are the potential complications of having a backboard on, number one. And then secondarily, is it even working? Mm -hmm. So are we causing complications to do something that's not helping at all, which is kind of, a, it's, well, essentially that's where we are now that we feel like we are causing complications in patients where it's not really helping. Kind of the main complications to worry about are, as you already mentioned, pain. That's not particularly comfortable to be on a backboard. It causes pain in just about anybody that gets put on one. There's a great article from Chan et al. in Annals of Emergency Medicine way back in 1994 where they took 21 perfectly healthy, healthy volunteers, uh, put them on a backboard for 30 minutes, and then took them off and asked them about pain. And across the board, probably doesn't surprise you that all 100% of them reported pain after having been on a backboard for, for a half hour. Mostly occipital, sacral, and lumbar, as you might expect, based on the way kind of our spine curves and lying on a hard board. But the, uh, another interesting thing is six of these uh, volunteers, so that's about 30%, still had pain, that pain, 48 hours later. Uh, so it's certainly something that can cause pain, and that leads straight into increased radiography. Because mm -hmm. if you've got a lot of extra pain that maybe wasn't even related to their injury and they get to the ER, you're probably going to end up doing scans or, or plain films based on the pain that they're reporting. Well, and even limited time for our elderly patient population, these are young, healthy folks. So, you know, if you got junk in your trunk and some decent sub-Q padding, mm -hmm. that's, it's not as huge a deal. You're going to have pain. But for our elderly patients, especially, uh, you know, the old, frail elderly where it's skin straight into bone, you know, it doesn't take long before you're going to actually start to get pressure oh, yeah. pressure lesions and pressure ulcers, and we know how that all plays out for us. Uh, that is definitely something that's been studied as well and is, is noted as a problem of, of being on a backboard. Uh, the paper that I pulled regarding to that one is by Berg and colleagues from pre-hospital emergency care in 2010, um, where they used actually something that's I don't fully understand personally because it's from the wound care literature. Um, is that they, they showed that there was a phenomenon of increased sacral tissue oxygenation. So increased tissue oxygenation in the sacrum immediately after somebody was pulled off of a backboard. And this is, from the wound literature, something that's linked to developing pressure ulcers. And that was within probably no more than 30 minutes of being on the backboard that they were showing these early signs of pressure ulcers. If your still system is fully gung-ho on backboards, you need to fix that. I mean, we're talking about studies showing harm and pain 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And yet we're just now, over the last 10 years, really getting to this paradigm shift and for the most part getting rid of them. And, and I still think a lot of systems are still pretty ginger with it, using any excuse to, to put them on. And it sounds like, other than, honestly, it really sounds like there's really no reason why it should be maintained throughout the entire transport. Um, because the beds are there, and that's that's the way we're going to do it is we're going to roll them as well. And my issue is we still have the trauma centers that they call and, and, and say, well, we need to put them on a backboard on their way over here. We oh. want them when, when they arrive. Like, that's one of my huge pet peeves. Is it I is. And so as, a, as an EMS professional, I work with um, my EMS job is I'm a, the associate medical director of uh, air medical service. Mm -hmm. And so it's not uncommon that we get transfers for spine fractures coming to the trauma center. And they often, as you might expect, with spine fractures, they frequently say put them back on a backboard. Yeah. My question is always what kind of spine fracture is it? Is it even an unstable spine fracture? If well, it's even not if it an is unstable an unstable fracture. fracture. Yeah. I mean, even in the research you got there shows mm -hmm. that the 
the mobility and movement on that board is more than on the cot itself. Mm -hmm. Just because we're on a slick surface and you move and you're actually getting more uh, displacement than you would on the bed itself. And, and, you know, I think there's this mindset that we have that somehow we're going to do something that's going to completely dislodge that. Mm -hmm. Well, just understand this patient went through major trauma, significant forces that have caused this injury. Unless your ambulance, God forbid, gets into an accident, something happens with the helicopter, or your bed tips over, there's no way in standard care with standard precautions that we are going to reenact the forces mm -hmm. necessary to kind of finish that off. The human body is actually very good at isolating and protecting itself in areas of discomfort like that. And so really it almost immobilizes itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just have to take extra measures in order to you know, not do unnecessary type strains on the body. But that board is not going to change it. There's a great, and you just reminded me of something. I don't have this citation right in front of me to give you the exact year and, and journal, but there was a great article by Hoswald. Um, I think it was in PEC as well, where he kind of does a, a theory piece of discussing Newtonian physics and and how likely are we to actually cause enough force to cause extra injury by keeping the patient within the normal range of motion of their spines, what it's supposed to do anyway, is very extremely low. Um, but the other information that you, such as what you just touched on, is that kind of the second part of this talk that I like to give people is, are they even working? Because some people would say, yeah, they've got complications. Yeah, it can cause problems. But, I mean, we're trying to prevent greater issues. But then the second question is, are they even really doing that? Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it's no. It's like that... Uh, they very much still allow movement. Often there's a lot of slack in the straps, even by people who put these on all day, every day. There's uh, often not as tight as they theoretically should be. Uh, there was one paper, um, let's see if I've got it in here, yep, yeah, by Peary in pre-hospital emergency care in 2007 where they kind of checked uh, for slack in the straps on people that were brought in on a backboard, placed by paramedics that are professionals at doing this. And 70% of the time, there was greater than four centimeters of slack in at least one of the straps and 12% of the time in four or more of the straps. And even when strapped down, it doesn't fully immobilize. You're like You can allow a little bit of axial rotation of the, of the neck or even lateral bending of the neck, particularly as you're dealing with the G-forces of driving around in a car or in a helicopter, and it's kind of slinging people around and pushing against the strap points as, as a fulcrum for causing more force right at that point and kind of helping turn things around. It really allows a fair amount of movement such that there have also been some papers about outcomes, like has it really helped the outcomes at all to put people on a backboard? And that, once again, is not particularly, particularly with penetrating trauma, is it's pretty much now, we'll shortly here talk about the position paper, pretty much now here really don't try and immobilize anybody that's had penetrating trauma because there has been good data uh, showing that in the setting of penetrating trauma, this is, was from HOT in uh, trauma in 2010, that there was an odds ratio of a little bit over two for mortality if you try and immobilize somebody after penetrating trauma versus leaving them unimmobilized. And the thought there is that it just, we were wasting a lot of time before getting them to where yeah. they need to be to, to have their issue taken care of. Then if you think about it, you know, you talked about the straps and the layout of the straps on boards. And if I get my straps tight enough to immobilize the spine, what is my secondary loss? One, you know, the first is going to be the increased pressure. You know, by strapping down and pulling that pressure on, it increased pressure on the soft tissues of the, of the back. Uh, but also significant restrictions on the respiratory status. you got the mm -hmm. two straps that come straight across the chest. You get those down tight enough, sure, they may not be moving at that point, but they're also not breathing that well either. And if you've got somebody who's got some sort of issue, pulmonary contusions, some thorax uh, trauma, you know, you can cause some issues there as well. And, you know, a lot of the papers, research I've looked at from the cervical spine standpoint is the immobilization on the backboard. You can get the head pretty solid down, especially with the blocks. And so basically you're doing this huge amount of stress as the body shifts around with what you're talking about, you know, that our ambulances ride like couches and they're shifting all over the place and you get all this force on the lower aspect of the C-spine and upper thoracic spine because the lower body is still moving, but you've got the head and neck immobilized now. And so you've really maximized and almost focused the stress on the spine itself. Oh, yeah. uh, so the potential of actually causing the, the secondary harm. And, you know, what I don't see, what I don't see in any of this research 
is anything that shows, yes, this is what we get out of it, the win, the benefit. This is the clear, defined benefit, positive outcome of boards. There's theoretical that it may decrease some of that motion, but we have clear detriments. We have clear bad outcomes associated with them. Particularly in those penetrating cases. Yes. But even in the blunt cases, there, there's no literature that I'm aware of that shows much in a difference in the way of mortality in blunt trauma, which is why we're still recommending it in certain or certain cases of blunt trauma. However, there was one that I found, um, which was also, this is Hoswald in, in uh, Academic Emergency Medicine in 1998, where they were testing in blunt trauma. And again, no real difference in mortality, but there was less neurologic disability afterwards when they were not put on a backboard. With, yeah. That's with the caveat that his odds ratio was 2.03 with a relatively wide confidence interval of 1.03 to 3.99, but still um, that's yet another trend of we're not really getting a win with these things, even though no. it's kind of always been the dogma that they were helping. No, and that's, you know, we, we talked, you know, in the, in the podcast from last week, we talked about tourniquets, and there is risk with them, but there is a clear benefit. There's mm-hmm. a clear win. You know, with these, you know, it's what we think would have been a win, but in the end, it's not really, it's not really a win, and there's a lot of risk associated with it. You know, what is lagged big time from this now is the C collar. Mm-hmm. And we know we're starting to get that now, and our, our American College surgeon friends are, are they're coming on board now with the, the C collar can be paired back quite a bit. But it's, it's very similar data that we're, we're seeing there that our C oh, collars yeah. are doing more harm than good. Same, same sort of thing. I don't have any of those citations in front of me for this talk, but um, it's a lot of the same things. You can cause pressure ulcers with the C collar kind of in the occipital region. Um, they certainly cause pain. Uh, there's, some, there's some data about it reducing the uh, venous outflow from mm-hmm. the head. And it kind of depends on what the injury is. There's certainly some injuries you can imagine uh, where kind of essentially putting a collar on that stretches the neck out kind of gives you more distraction between the the shoulders and the base of the head that that might be a bad thing depending on the type of injury that's in there. And there's kind of no real way to know that beforehand without getting your imaging. So, Well, even that, the, re, the research I've seen is the, this, a neck roll is just as good yeah. and, seem, and seems to better fit the patient as opposed to a one, two, or three size fits most approach that we have. And almost all of us have seen more often than not, the C collar is poorly fit or, or completely displaced on these patients when they come in. I mean, you mentioned the cardiovascular, the, the circulatory changes, the pressure, the, the fact that uh, it, it puts traction, it jacks up the, the natural uh, lordotic curve of the cervical spine. Uh, but even, you know, even that respiratory that respiratory status of mm-hmm. putting that on the on the neck and the pressure, and still the chances if they've lived through the trauma that is severe enough to break their neck, the chances that I am going to reenact that with enough force to further exacerbate that is unlikely compared to the potential risks associated with the C spine. And we're not there; it hasn't been as much of a push to get rid of the C collar as much. But in the next five years. I, I see a significant mm-hmm. drive to to get them out of the majority of practice. So what do you feel? So you've got, you're big into EMS, and we're, we've all got these things now, you know, that we were getting these movements, and now all the groups are starting to come together and put together some consensus. Where are we right now with these, with, with the consensus on, our spinal immobilization, seat collars, that sort of thing. So what we alluded to at the beginning of this talk is that there was very recently a paper, a joint position statement published. Uh, it was published in pre-hospital emergency care uh, in 2018, just towards the end of 2018. I believe it was in August. And it's a joint position statement of ASEP, the National Association of EMS Physicians, and the ACS Committee on Trauma. One thing that's one kind of interesting makes me chuckle a little bit thing is that they've decided to change terminology on us. They're very much strongly saying we shouldn't be calling it spinal immobilization anymore because of all the things that we just talked about mm-hmm. where it doesn't actually immobilize anything that um, really the more appropriate term is spinal motion restriction. So you may have heard that and wonder why we decided to change. And that has to do a lot with everything that we were just talking about of them not being that good at immobilizing the spine. Uh, but so where we are right now from this position paper is that First off, I'll just go ahead and say what we alluded to before is that we shouldn't be putting 
any sort of backboard or vacuum splint or, or what have you on somebody who's a victim of penetrating trauma because it just wastes time and doesn't help and actually some data showing a higher mortality. Uh, so for blunt trauma patients, for the most part, it's your nexus criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, what they wrote in the article was anyone that's acutely altered level of consciousness, i.e. GCS of less than 15 or clearly intoxicated, midline neck or back pain and or tenderness, focal neurologic sign and or symptoms, anatomic deformity of the spine or distracting circumstances of the injury, which I'm sure that sounds very familiar to everybody because that's essentially the nexus criteria. That's what they're recommending. We do some sort of spinal motion restriction on patients for. But that doesn't what, necessarily what mean. Yeah, what qualifies yeah. as spinal motion restriction is essentially a C collar and some method of keeping the head, neck, torso in alignment. And so that doesn't have to be a backboard. That can be the ambulance stretcher. That can be a vacuum mattress like we talked about before. That can be the ED cot as long as they're kind of kept straight and have a C collar on is all this position paper is saying we need to do anymore. And uh, with the ambulance stretchers, you mean you got the stretchers, they got the straps on there. Oh, yeah. You can do all that stuff. And I, th I think you're going to achieve better motion restriction than you're going to get on any type of rigid type device. Mm -hmm. I agree. The one thing that they point out that's worth mentioning now that we're moving away from using backboards, one of the things we said at the very beginning of this episode is that what they're still good for is transferring patients, is keeping somebody flat and, on, and in a line while you're moving them. So if people are coming into your emergency department just on the ambulance cot with a uh, C collar in place, that is totally appropriate. You just need to be all the more careful about moving them over to the ED cot. Somebody holding a C-spine, multiple people helping with uh, a draw sheet, or even better, a slide board of some, of some sort to keep them straight as they come across to the stretcher. That's a, that's a big point worth making. So take a look at it. Review your practice. Figure out where you are, either, whether it's in the hospital setting, EMS setting, wherever it may be. Um, if you're still using a ton of backboards, you probably need to rethink things. And we probably also need to uh, limit some of that C-spine. In fact, you know, it's funny is I, I used to make fun of what I would call the litigation collars, which is the, the soft collar. You know, they were oh, only yeah. there for the mm -hmm. lawyers and showing up in court. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they actually have probably a little bit more utility than the actual rigid C-collars in terms of safety, but also providing, you know, what some limitation in, in movement. Um, but honestly... You know, if we just use proper techniques, we use precaution, um, we don't go all, you know, Chuck Norris and John Wayne on our patients, you know, we will be, our patients will be fine, um, and we will provide them better care, more comfortable, less complications, and still uh, reach our equivalent outcomes that we have. How can folks get in touch with you if they, if they have more questions? Uh, so my, my work email here in Chattanooga is probably the best way to get in touch with me, and that's my first name dot last name, so frank.tift at erlanger.org. That would be the best way. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks. Two great episodes on EMS uh, stuff. And as for me, I've got to get you back. Uh, you're giving a talk here in 15 minutes. we got to get you yep. ready for action. <laughs> as for me, uh, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, at everydaymed on Twitter, as well as our ASAP Frontline Facebook page. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. Mm -hmm.